Ready? Great. Can everyone hear me on this microphone in the back? Great. My name is Richard Parker, and I teach at the Kennedy School of Government. I'm an economist by training, uh, but I teach at the Kennedy School uh, and therefore teach policy uh, and economics rather than economics as it's taught broadly in the Department of Economics here at Harvard. It's a pleasure to follow Steve Marglin, who's one of the great figures of the Harvard Economics Department and uh, a great figure who uh, deserves uh, more attention from all of you, both as a teacher and in terms of his work. And so I, uh, I commend him to you and thank him for uh, speaking here today. Uh, I feel a little bit like uh, Bob Reich used to say he felt when he followed John Kenneth Galbraith. When I follow Steve Marglin, I feel like saying, I used to be just as tall as you were, Professor Galbraith, uh, but uh, in fact, I'm still standing, and uh, I'm not as short as my good friend Bob Reich, but uh, I am convinced that Steve is pointing to a fundamental crisis in the ideology of uh, economics that I think is an ongoing struggle, one that he's been engaged in for more than 40 years, and one that's going to present itself as a struggle going forward over the next several decades, but not without change. It's an important thing to understand that there's more than one way to look at this issue of ideology and economics. Uh, one was offered by Harvard theologian Harvey Cox 20 years ago in an article called The Market as God in the Atlantic Monthly, and I commend the article to you. It's easy to find online. Uh, Professor Cox makes this very interesting observation. He says, take Emile Durkheim's classic sociological definition of a God-based system. What does it claim? It claims that its central power has three qualities. It has omniscience, it has omnipotence, and it has omnipresence. And then Professor Cox says, look around you in the world today and ask yourself what one system in the world claims to be all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-present. Not traditional religion as we understand Christianity or Islam or Judaism or Buddhism or Hinduism, but the religion of God. In other words, rather than seeing this potentially as an ideology of economics, you might entertain the possibility, while we're looking for frames, of thinking of this as a theology of economics, with the God that you are meant to worship carrying the name market, or perhaps the word that cannot be spoken, profit. Now, what I want to do is two things. I want to briefly talk uh, about uh, economists and economics uh, to underscore what Professor Margolin has said, and then I want to talk particularly about the Greek crisis, because for the last two years I've been getting on a plane and flying to Athens where along with Amartya Sen and Joseph Stiglitz, I've been serving as an economic advisor to George Papandreou, who just stepped down as the Prime Minister of Greece. And so for better or for worse, I've had a close-in opportunity to see the so-called Greek and so-called Euro crisis unfold, and I want to drive home today, if I possibly can, an argument which is not well made or even often surfaced in the American press, although it's gaining more and more interest and credibility in Europe. Let me recommend to you, in addition to Harvey Cox's Market as God article in the Atlantic for a refreshingly light-hearted uh, tweak of uh, economists, uh, an, a report called the COGI Report. The acronyms are for Committee on Graduate Education in Economics, and it was a report commissioned by the American Economic Association itself and it asked a dozen and a half uh, prominent economists, including Larry Summers, Joe Stiglitz, Kenneth Arrow, certainly not marginal figures by any means in the profession, to spend a year and a half looking at the state of graduate education in economics 20 years ago. The telling single datum that I like to report is that they found in surveys of graduate professors, professors who teach at the graduate level, not undergraduate, teach graduate economics, that 62% said that the profession was over-mathematicized and unrelated to the real world. In other words, nearly two-thirds of economists teaching at the graduate level in the United States 20 years ago, by then already recognized a fundamental crisis in the analytic capacities of modern-day economics and its relationship to the world as such. A separate survey conducted of graduate students in economics found that the single most important thing graduate students felt they needed to know 
this was 95% of them, was uh, mathematics in order to model. Asked if they needed uh, any understanding of the economy itself or of economic history, 10% thought knowing economic history was important, 15 thought knowing something about the economy was important. So I don't know whether that constitutes an ideology, but it does certainly constitute a worldview. That somehow a profession that is meant to serve as an analytics of the world as it is, with the possibility of changing it for something that broadly can be construed as the better, had lost touch with that world and had become hermetically entrapped in questions involving mathematics, but having very little to do with the world as it was experienced by whether one calls it the 99% or the 100% or the 95. So there's a profound uh, uh, lesson to be learned by looking at economists' own analysis of their profession. You can find it in the Journal of Economic Literature, published by the American Economic Association. This is not Marxist, this is not libertarian, this is the mainstream itself, and it, is, and it and bears reading. You might also want to look at a short article I did in American Prospect about 15 years ago called, Can Economists Save Economics? It essentially used material from Kogi and other studies to suggest that this trap of mathematicization of economics and its divorce from the real world was causing economics to become in some sense irrelevant. And I interviewed people on Wall Street, people in large corporate firms. Some, one Wall Street uh, person said to me, you know, we like graduates of economics programs, but we really take about five years to get out of their head most of what they've learned before they can become useful to us. So in analytic terms, there seems to be a learning process that takes quite a few years beyond the acquisition of knowledge in graduate or even undergraduate programs. I should mention also that the problem of uh, economics as ideology, and at least Harvard's willingness to accommodate competing ideologies, is not new in the last 10 or 15 years. The Harvard Economics Department was the first economics department created in an American university. It was created in 1870, and it was created by the famous uh, Charles Eliot, the great pioneering uh, and reforming president of Harvard. <coughs> But here's the curious story. There was a man teaching a kind of economics uh, as a branch of moral philosophy, which is the way that political economy, as it was called in those days, was considered a branch of moral philosophy. But he had angered a number of the overseers and wealthy Boston merchants of the time by advocating two what seemed then heretical positions. One was free trade at a time when the gospel of the Republican Party was against free trade. The other was that he wanted Civil War bonds redeemed at par, not taking account of the inflation damage that had been done to bonds, excuse me, that he wanted the, 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 the bonds redeemed at par to take account, not to take account of inflationary damage caused by the Civil War, which was anathema to the very Boston merchants who had bought the bonds in order to help finance the federal government's purchase of material and equipment from those self-same merchants. And so the heterodox views of this economics professor meant that he was persona non grata, and President Eliot, taking this into account, appointed a new young man named Laughlin, who became the first full professor of economics at Harvard, and his qualifications were the following. He had a BA in classics from Harvard uh, College, and he was an editorial writer for a conservative Boston newspaper. President Elliott was, in fact, so embarrassed by the decision he'd made that he insisted on sending Laughlin off to Germany to study for three years before he would actually allow Laughlin to teach in the department. Thus, Harvard Economics was born. Now, I want to talk to you about uh, the Greek crisis, because I think many of you know what the Greek crisis is about. What you know is that Greeks are spendthrifts. They're the Dionysians of Southern Europe versus the Apollonians of Northern Europe. <laughs> the party animals of the Mediterranean versus the Calvinist doers of, uh, uh, of the North. You know that uh, they have borrowed recklessly and uh, with abandon. You know that <coughs> uh, they don't work hard at all, 
and you know that they are fundamentally anti-business. Nobody can actually start a business in Greece because it's such a hostile, left-wing, as well as lazy-ass country. <laughs> Let me offer you a little bit of data. The first is that from mid-1990s to the mid-2000s, Greece was the fastest growing country in Europe, over 4.5% per year. That had a relatively high debt to GDP ratio of about 90 to 100 percent of debt to GDP ratio, but it was growing at such a rate that no one at the time, not the IMF, not the OECD, not the uh, Europeans, not the bankers in London or Paris or Frankfurt or elsewhere that looked at Greece, thought that there was a problem fundamentally in Greece that was one of laziness and shiftlessness. Quite to the contrary, many across Northern Europe in the early part of the 21st century admired Greece as a, as a new story of what, uh, uh, what Europe could do uh, if, uh, if allowed to compete successfully in a larger and integrated Europe. The second is the story about Greeks being lazy. Well, in fact, what you find looking at eight OECD comparative tables is that Greeks work the longest hours per year of any country in Western Europe. The longest hours of any country in Western Europe. Now, you've heard another story, as I say, which is that they're anti-business. In fact, they have the highest number of entrepreneurs, the highest number of small businesses in Europe. In fact, small and medium-sized enterprises make up one quarter of the economy, far more than it does in a country like the United States. Oh, but you say, well, Professor Parker, there's this further problem, which was that the Greek government was crippling Greece with its high taxes. Go again to the OECD tables. Look at the tables for Greece and look at the tables for the United States. We here in America pay a higher percentage of GDP in taxes uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Greeks pay a higher percentage, no, I'm sorry, the Greeks pay a higher percentage of GDP in taxes than the Americans do. It isn't that the Greeks don't pay taxes, they pay a, a, a quite high level of taxes. How is this possible when we hear all these stories of income tax evasion? It's because the bulk of Greek taxes are collected in the form of VAT taxes on transactions, and are also collected as excise taxes on tra transactions involving fuel and tobacco and, uh, and, and alcohol. And they're also collected as deductions from monthly payroll checks in the form of Social Security, with Social Security being a much larger chunk of one's uh, uh, average paycheck because Social Security in Europe is so much more comprehensive. As a consequence, roughly 33 to 35% of GDP in Greece is absorbed by taxation. So now we have a different story of what's going on in Greece, at least one that doesn't seem to match up with the commonplace Michael Lewis story of, of the Dionysians. We have a story of a people working hard, of a people that are fundamentally a culture of small business. Any of you who've been to Greece know the thousands of tavernas and little shops. This is not a country of Walmart. This is not a country of General Motors. This is not a country of the vast suburban shopping mall. This is where entrepreneurship and business in the classic neoclassical textbook sense is alive and well. Huge numbers of small actors unable to influence the pri their prices and therefore competing against one another in order to max optimize profit at the margins. Now, how then is it that this story of the Greeks as moral failures grew up so quickly in 2009 and became the reigning dogma of the story we tell about the Greek crisis. Let me submit that it fit perfectly, this story, inside a story that Germans were prepared to believe about what they saw as the overarching failure of Europe, which was the overarching unwillingness of Europe to be German. <laughs> I mean this metaphorically, but I also mean it quite really. It's also important to understand that it was not simply a German question, 
but a conservative German question. We overlook politics and so much of what we talk about in Europe today, but what we have to remember is that the governments that have fallen are the socialist government of Papandreou in Greece, the socialist government Suarez in uh, Portugal, the socialist government in Spain, all, well, uh, meanwhile, all, all at the behest or all at the unwillingness of conservative governments in Paris and, 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 and Berlin to act to bail out Europe. Now what could this possibly be about? Why would the Germans take this attitude? Well, it is the case that there is embedded deep in German culture a fear of Weimar-like inflation. One cannot discount this. But there's also an unacknowledged role that the Germans have in creating the crisis that we label as the crisis of Greece or even the crisis of the Euro, and that is this, which is that with the coming of the integration of European countries into single customs and then single currency zones, Germany acquired a huge advantage compared to its competitors. It's quite impossible for the Greeks to outproduce uh, the Germans when it comes to high-end vehicles. It's equally impossible for the Greeks to uh, undercut the pricing of imports from China. And you have to remember that it's Europe as a whole, not the United States, that is China's biggest export co uh, uh, customer. And so for mid-size or smaller countries in, uh, uh, in Europe, the problem has been how in a world of integrated currencies, one single currency, and integrated markets, Greece can move up the production uh, scale quickly enough, or up the, up the efficiency scale, to find a mix of goods that pre prevents an ongoing and, and, and destructive uh, uh, balance of payments problem. And that's really where Greece's problem lay all along in this period. As Greece was growing, it was growing more affluent, and it was importing more from Germany. Greece's deficits were mirrored euro for euro in Germany's surpluses. And Germany, not Greece, acted irresponsibly by being unwilling to rechannel those surpluses back into Europe as a whole to maintain overall European growth. The problem was not in the last decade Greece or Portugal or to some extent Spain. Each of these stories has more complications than I'm allowing for. But the central responsibility lay with the Germans and their huge trade surpluses and their unwillingness to recycle those trade surpluses in such a way that it mitigated the current account balances that so many of these smaller and relatively weaker economies uh, uh, were facing. Nonetheless, the growth story of Greece is quite impressive. As I tell you, for a decade, it was the fastest growing country in Europe. And so despite adversity, it was moving forward. And the fact that it was not increasing its debt to GDP ratio is a sign not only of its uh, growth, but of its ability for a time to manage its current account imbalances. So what went wrong? In short, I would argue that Greece was roadkill collateral damage when Wall Street broke down. It wasn't that Greece was the problem, it was that Wall Street was the problem, and it was that Washington had conspired with Wall Street to remove regulations on uh, <coughs> Wall Street operators of all kinds, whether it obtained uh, in terms of the products that were being offered that were oftentimes not merely opaque but dishonestly opaque, the CDOs crammed with crappy mortgages alongside good ones that were sold off with excellent credit ratings from our friends at Standard & Poor's, which never noticed there was a problem until three weeks before the market started collapsing. Oops, what kind of credit rating, is this? A credit rating agency is this? It doesn't notice there's a problem at Pearl Harbor until the Arizona sinks. This is quite peculiar in terms of its claim to serve an efficient role in terms of monitoring credit markets in the United States or the world as a whole. The second problem was that the shadow banking system, that para-banking system that was not encompassed by regulated entities of the old banking system that most of us, or at least of my generation, had grown up with, meant that you had, at, uh, by 2006, over $2 trillion parked in hedge funds 
that while they operated for the most part out of Fairfield and Greenwich, Connecticut, were incorporated in the Cayman Islands and the Bahamas. Now, a friend of mine, looking at data from the Federal Reserve a couple of years ago, noticed that of the foreign, foreign countries that hold U.S. treasuries, China is, of course, number one, Japan, number two, but if you look, number six is the Cayman Islands. This is an island, a one island, with 16,000 population, and as my friend said, damn, they must have a hell of a lot of ATMs on that island to need <laughs> that amount of money. So what you've had over the last 10 years is not an increasing problem of the Greeks, but an increasing failure of the Americans to regulate our financial system in a way that we know has done enormous damage to us, but which I want to tell you here has and continues to do enormous damage to Europe and other parts of the world, and it is not within the power of Greece alone, nor of Europe if it continues to focus only on the issue of the euro and of fiscal, financial, uh, fiscal responsibility to solve this problem. Fiscal federalism by itself and coordinated uh, 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 supervision of national government budgets and the locking in of national budgets to a no-deficit constitutional rule does not address the problem. This is the broken leg of a man who has cancer. And the cancer is that Europe collectively does not have the power to constrain American finance capital because America is unwilling to constrain American finance capital. Out of Dodd-Frank so far, we don't have significant regulation of capital markets. We have more banks too big to fail today than we did five years ago. The six largest banks in the United States control something like 65% of the total deposits of banks. The sum total of the GDPs of the world today, of all the 200 and some countries of the world today, is about 60 or 65 trillion dollars. The sum total of the value of all derivatives traded in markets today is somewhere north of 600 trillion dollars. And this is just of derivatives. What we have created is a global financial system which has vastly outgrown not just the power of individual governments to regulate it, but of utility for the world of real goods and real production. And again, it is not a question when we look at Europe of looking at something far away and foreign and unconnected to American reality, when in fact what you're seeing in Europe today and in Greece is, I would argue, the second wave of this global financial crisis, the first wave of which we have lived through, but the second wave of which may very easily wash back onto our shores next week if Mrs. Merkel and others gathered this week to try once again to find a solution, do not find a solution that what? Satisfies the markets. What world of democratic governments do we live in when the lives of 400 million people in Europe are subordinated to the affection or disaffection of the markets? We need to change the ground rules of the relationship between markets, in particular financial markets, and governance. And it is not a solution that can be found on a nation-by-nation -nation basis any longer. It must be found on an international basis, and this will be one of the great political struggles of your era, just as Glass-Steagall and the Securities and Exchange Act were the great struggles of the 1930s. Those laws put in place a regulated financial system that for 40 years served the United States and the majority of its population. From the mid-1930s to the mid-1970s, there was not one, not one single major bank failure in the United States. You're looking at the alternative reality, at the alternative possibility of seeing massive systemic failure on a decadal basis going forward. The IMF already reports that three quarters of its member countries have gone through a major financial market collapse, and that was prior to 2008. 
So what I want to tell you out of the Greek experience, what I want to tell you out of the European experience is that while all of you need to focus on turning around what is wrong with Wall Street, remember that it is not an American but a global problem. And you need allies across the Atlantic and across the Pacific and a politics that is truly transnational, not national, if you plan to succeed. Thank you.